Okay. Um, so thank you for joining us today, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. San von der Klei. San has a PhD from Bradbound University of Nijmegen and is now a research fellow at the University of Birmingham. She's interested in reading and language development in children and adolescents, more specifically um, in how much we read and what we read influences our vocabulary and reading development. So um, Sam's gonna do around 45 minute presentation um, and then there'll be time for questions at the end of this session but if anything comes up um, as she's speaking please feel free to put your questions in the chat and then um, we can cover those at the end of the session so whenever you're ready <laughs> oh, thanks and and do feel free to uh, interrupt me if there's anything unclear on what I'm saying I'm happy to quickly answer those questions and I don't think I'll be able to see the chat so okay I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat for you. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, so yeah, what I'll be talking about today is um, a longitud longitudinal study uh, on reading and vocabulary development um, in mid-childhood, early ad adolescence, um, at a time when children are transitioning from primary to uh, secondary education. And um, just want to say that most of what I'll be talking about today is um, data from a project that I've worked on with Jesse Ricketts from Moria Holloway University and uh, Laura Shapiro from Aston University. And um, I got to work with them on a project called the Reading and Vocabulary Project. Um, and um, is actually a project that started out as the Aston Literacy Project uh, back in 2011. Um, which followed um, early reading development and reading related skills uh, when children entered reception at age four. And uh, currently children um, who have been part of the study are in their GCSE year. Um, so really long study. Um, I've added a citation here for the like uh, a paper on the earlier stages. So that really focuses on phonological memory and early reading development, if you're interested. Um, so yeah, the, the project I've worked on uh, focused on uh, reading and vocabulary development um, in adolescence, um, which is a time when, of course, reading, especially reading development, is not as rapid as in earlier stages as when children start out to learn how to read, but they still show significant growth and um, reading development at, at this age, I think, throughout, like from the start onwards, is also characterized by a very high rank order stability. And uh, one of the many reasons for starting this uh, or focusing more on vocabulary um, at when children were at the end of primary, so um, at around age 10, uh, were reports on concerns from teachers about children starting secondary school with uh, limited vocabulary affecting their learning and concerns about attainment and motivation dips um, around that school transition period. On the right, I've added a nice um, summary report from uh, Oxford University Press called the Oxford Language Report. It sort of summarizes some of these concerns. Um, and um, well, of course, um, we want yeah, we wanted to focus on school transition. And as you well know, this is typically when children um, move from a smaller friendly environment to a larger environment where they have to move between classes or taught by a greater number of teachers. Uh, but also very importantly, language and literacy demands also change around this time. Uh, pupils are expected to have more autonomy over their learning and um, read independently um, as a source for, for, for learning that becomes more and more um, important. And uh, there have been studies, of course, on that focus on transition from primary to secondary education, um, but many of those were more focused on uh, well-being and a more broader uh, academic outcomes. And what we were interested in was these very specific reading and vocabulary skills. And um, there have been a few bit smaller skilled studies on this, and um, especially for reading comprehension, some seem to indicate that there was this sort of stagnation, slowing of growth around this time um, of transitioning from one school to the other. Um, and um, another aspect that we also wanted to look into um, around this time, so while looking at school transition, is uh, potential differences between children from um, higher and lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Because um, 
well, children from lower SES backgrounds um, are sometimes found to start out with uh, lower word reading or reading related skills. Um, although some studies do seem to show that word reading skills at least can, uh, differences seem to disappear towards the end of primary school uh, when children become more skilled uh, readers. But at least language differences seem to arise early and seem to be more persistent. And um, we were interested in seeing whether, um, um, as it has been found that children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds uh, can sometimes struggle a bit more with the transition to, um, uh, to secondary school or high schools, um, especially when they uh, lack parental support or other uh, resources. And we were interested in uh, whether this was also visible in these um, um, outcome measures that we were um, assessing. So um, the aim of our the first study I'm um, talking about today is um, we want to measure the influence of SES and secondary school transition on children's uh, growth in reading and vocabulary. And um, what we expected is um, to find SES differences uh, for these vocabulary and reading comprehension, so the more language-based measures, and to, to, for them to be small or, or even um, non-existent uh, for word reading at this age group. And um, just because we found that um, rank order stability for these measures is very stable over time, we, we expect it to be that any sort of differences um, for these SES SES effects might be um, quite stable as well. And um, as I mentioned before, um, we didn't have a very strong um, previous evidence base for this to know what to expect, but we were also interested in uh, testing the interaction between the two, so between SES and school transition effects, and see if uh, any effect of school transition might be stronger for children from lower SES backgrounds when they maybe um, lack uh, um, resources, whether that's, this is at home or in school. And if that is potentially also visible in uh, our measures of reading and vocabulary. But this was more tentative than uh, our expectations for the other um, um, questions. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, this uh, started out as the Aston literacy sample. Um, and this is a group of children uh, from uh, Birmingham, mainly north and south suburban areas of, Bur uh, of Birmingham. And um, at the start of the study, when they were in primary school, they were in 16 different primary schools. 18% um, of the sample back then was eligible for free school meals, which was around the national average back then. And 10% uh, of the children um, had English as additional language, which is slightly below the national, national average. And um, children then sort of spread out um, to uh, 53 different secondary schools still in and around Birmingham, which was quite a challenge to, uh, <laughs> uh, to visit all schools every time. But, uh, that's a different story. Um, so this is an overview um, of the measures that we uh, used. So um, this uh, here you can see the timeline again from age four to uh, age 13. Um, and uh, we measured, uh, measured uh, word reading throughout the study. So first um, a different measure, but later on uh, we used TAWI for those of you who know it, um, which um, is mainly word reading efficiency. So the amount of words children can read um, in, oh, I think two minutes, can't believe I forgot, <laughs> but in this sort of set time. So the number of words read correctly is that. Um, and then um, uh, reading comprehension and um, different, two different types of vocabulary. Um, we also had uh, measures of uh, children's reading activity, but I'll go into that a bit later. And um, vocabulary was also assessed. Um, at the start of reception, so before any formal reading instructions. Yeah, so these are and the measures um, that are that we used to, um, to measure growth over this time from year five all the way up until year eight uh, were the reading and vocabulary measures. Um, so yeah, we split up the um, sample into a higher and a lower SES group. So um, the higher SES group were children who had a mother with a university degree or higher, 
and had never been eligible for free school meals. And um, of course, our lower SES group, which were all remaining children. And um, just to explain a bit more about the type of vocabulary that we measured. So we had a measure of um, what we called everyday vocabulary for those of you who know it, uh, the BPVS, which is a um, receptive vocabulary test that um, children are shown uh, for pictures, they hear words and are asked to um, indicate which picture um, corresponds to that word. Um, and I know it uh, contains a bit more than just everyday vocabulary, but um, this is how we characterize it uh, for now. And um, everyday vocabulary is vocabulary that you typically pick up on in um, spoken language, written language, just an everyday environment. And then we were also interested in a different type of vocabulary, which was a curriculum related measure. Um, and this is a vocabulary that you typically just pick up on from written materials. And in this case, from um, mainly from um, the curriculum related materials that children encounter in schools. And this was based on key stage two and three STEM learning materials. So um, words related to the physics and biology curriculum. Um, and we had it evaluated by primary and secondary teachers. Um, and on the right, you can see two examples. So like the BPVS, it showed uh, children four pictures, they heard a word and were asked to indicate uh, which picture uh, belonged to that word. Um, so yeah, here is uh, the timeline again. As I said, we had um, measured uh, their reading and vocabulary from year five until year eight. So when children were uh, 10 years of age, until they were 12 or 13. Um, and we had um, measured their, um, we had five time points um, um, where we measured their reading and vocabulary skills. And um, to look at the specific effects of school transition, we split up this timeline into five, uh, four phases. Um, the important one being the growth children made um, in the summer so between the end of year six and early, um, so the beginning of year seven. And we compared that to growth that they made in the school year uh, before the transition to secondary school and growth in these skills that they made in the school year after they transitioned to secondary school. And to know for sure that any sort of slowing of growth um, during this transition summer was not just because it was a summer holiday compared to school years, we also um, compare this to uh, any growth in skills that they made during a, what we call a normal summer holiday where they didn't transition to a new school. Hope this is still all clear. Um, so here you can see um, the outcomes for our vocabulary measures. So on the left, you see uh, our everyday vocabulary measure and on the right, the graph with the curriculum vocabulary outcomes. The um, solid line is our lower SES group, um, and the, do uh, the dotted line is, or the dashed line, is the higher SES group. Um, and it's difficult to see, but the dots are individual participants, so sort of scatter plots added to, uh, to this uh, graph. And um, it's very light, but the gray dots are the higher SES group, and the black dots is our lower SES group. And uh, well, you can see from those lines that overall we found a significant difference between the higher and lower SES group for both our vocabulary measures. But as you can see from those uh, dots, um, it's hard to really um, like tease them apart, how do you say that? Um, but there is substantial overlap between groups. So even though overall there's, there's a difference there, um, it's not inevitable. Like, some lower SES uh, children did perform really well um, and some of the higher SES children scored similarly to our lower SES group. So there is just a lot of overlap there. Um, I think that's important to point out. Um, and um, as far as uh, progress, so what we saw for um, our everyday vocabulary measure, we saw that there was a significant growth throughout the study. So between each time point, um, children um, significantly improved um, in their uh, vocabulary levels, whether that was uh, during the school transition or in the school years. But um, interestingly for our curriculum related measure, 
um, we found that there was significant growth uh, during the school years, but not across the summer holidays. Um, so on children only showed significant growth in this um, sort of school related measure uh, while they were in school um, and not during the summer. And this was the same for both the transition summer and um, the normal, normal summer. <laughs> And um, yeah, com to compare it to uh, word reading, the reading measure. So on the left, word reading, on the right, outcomes for reading comprehension. As you can see, we didn't have reading comprehension measure um, in year five. So um, that explains that gap there. Um, so for our word reading measure, we did not find a significant difference between our SES groups um, and uh, reading comprehension like the vocabulary measures did show um, a significant difference. Um, and um, also comparable to the vocabulary results is for word reading, we found significant growth throughout the study. So during the school year and during the summer holidays, um, but for reading comprehension like our curriculum measure. So this is maybe a skill that you um, also typically pay more attention on during school time, I don't know, but uh, we only found significant growth during the school year for our reading comprehension measure and not um, for our summer holidays. So yeah, um, what we take from this is um, we did find SES differences associated with our more language-based measures, so vocabulary, reading comprehension, but uh, not for this more constrained skill, not for word reading. Um, and like I tried to point out before, um, there was considerable overlap between groups. Um, and uh, we found no evidence for what you want to call a transition slump. So any um, lack of growth or stagnation in growth uh, related to the uh, school transition. Um, but we found that skills continue to develop. But um, it's more likely that when you measure the same skill over time, um, before and after transition, you see con consistent growth, but it's more likely that expectations change in secondary school. So the way we assess their skills, maybe the type of materials they are expected to read um, is what changes. And that's, we thought that that might explain any, um, um, the reason for, for, for this concern about uh, transition slumps um, rather than that it's actually something in their skills that um, sort of drops or slumps. Um, and uh, what we found interesting and we hadn't really um, thought of before, but um, what we found interesting to see is that it does also really measure how you measure vocabulary. So we found subtle differences between um, growth trajectories for our more everyday type vocabulary and uh, curriculum vocabulary. Um, and um, also something that um, we haven't measured during this study, but I think would be very important to um, also um, look into in the future is um, something called the tier two vocabulary or sometimes referred to as academic vocabulary. So that's uh, like a word analyze here. So more abstract, later acquired vocabulary that you also typically learn from um, written materials, but it's also very important type of vocabulary to access um, um, these secondary school texts across subjects. Um, and it would be very interesting to see how these develop over time and how they relate to um, school performance. Um, um, especially after they just transition to secondary school. Um, so yeah, that's what I had to say about um, their first study. And then um, another question that we aim to address with this longitudinal uh, sample is um, what the role of um, independent reading is um, on um, children's vocabulary and reading comprehension ability. Um, as I said before, um, especially at this age or later on in reading development, independent reading becomes a more important source for learning um, and children are expected to read more on their own um, for uh, 
learning in schools, but also um, um, exposure to book reading, so um, fiction reading, reading that children do in their own time uh, becomes a very important source for uh, vocabulary learning um, as exposures to a right, wide range of words in diverse and meaning, meaningful contexts um, can be uh, helpful in developing high quality lexical representations. So, uh, representations that contain information about the meaning, the spelling, and um, the pronunciation of words. Um, and this is something that um, is not always taken into account when modeling this association or, um, between things like word reading, vocabulary, and reading comprehension. And so that is what we were interested in here in this second study. Um, oh, sorry. I'm not progressing. Oh. Yeah, I'm back. Um, so this is a um, sort of a schematic overview of what we aim to um, model in uh, our second study is um, whether, so um, word reading is directly associated with um, reading comprehension and vocabulary ability, like in many, um, um, what we know from things like the simple view of reading, that um, language and um, decoding are important for reading comprehension, for instance. Um, and what we aim to test here is whether we still see, even in adolescence, uh, so early adolescence, um, whether we still see that um, uh, word reading directly predicts children's uh, vocabulary and reading comprehension skills, so whether better able readers can free up more resources for learning and which can help um, acquire vocabulary, um, which can help comprehend texts, or whether you can uh, see that independent reading also plays a role here. So whether uh, better readers also choose to read more in their own time, as has been shown in um, a few previous uh, studies, and if this in turn also has beneficial um, effects um, on children's vocabulary and reading comprehension over this direct relation between word reading um, and these outcome measures. So also aim to test, is it uh, a direct relation, indirect or both? Um, so uh, in addition to um, the word and reading and vocabulary measures that we assessed, um, we also um, use data um, that tapped into um, read children's reading activity. Uh, this is the Pearl's um, reading questionnaire that we used for that. And this is a questionnaire that asks about um, children's reading habits. So how much time they spend reading, what types of materials they read um, and um, their motivation for reading. Um, and uh, we also um, modeled in um, vocabulary uh, from age four before formal reading instruction. Um, so this is our outcome measure, of, uh, sorry, our model, that, um, our final model. Um, and at the top, you can see our um, reading activity measures, which we call leisure reading here, because we used um, the questions from the questionnaire that ask children about how much time they spend uh, reading in their own time and how much they, um, read stories or novels, so, so mainly trying to capture um, fiction reading, book reading um, with that. Um, and uh, what we found is, um, like in those previous studies, that uh, word reading ability was associated with um, subsequent uh, reading um, habits, um, so their leisure reading, so better readers tend to read more in their own time. Um, and we found that this was also um, the amount of reading they did in their own time was also re related to their uh, later vocabulary levels. So um, children who read more in their own time scored higher on our uh, vocabulary measures. And um, there was no direct relation with reading comprehension. Um, and uh, we found that even in this later stage of their reading development, word reading ability was still also directly associated with children's vocabulary and reading comprehension ability. And even after um, controlling for these very early, so um, school entry vocabulary and uh, letter sound knowledge at age four, which was also interesting to see that um, um, in, even in this model, um, 
vocabulary at age four and letter knowledge at age four was um, related to vocabulary knowledge at age 12, um, which I found quite interesting. Um, so yeah, um, so for the second study, um, um, again, just to summarize, um, our, what we took from this is um, that um, even at the end of primary, beginning of secondary education, both reading activity and children's uh, reading ability independently predicted their vocabulary knowledge. So better readers read more books and reading more um, help you increase your vocabulary. Um, and um, we did not find this for reading comprehension, but again, I think important to note here that um, reading com and comprehension and vocabulary here were quite highly correlated. Um, which um, when we fitted just reading comprehension in this model, we did find a significant association, but that disappeared as soon as you controlled for vocabulary knowledge. Um, and um, also interesting is that this direct relation between word reading skills and uh, vocabulary knowledge and reading comprehension um, at the end of uh, primary and secondary education, which can suggest that um, improving word reading skills, even later on in reading development, can maybe have some uh, knock-on effects on vocabulary and reading comprehension. And especially for struggling readers, basic re supporting basic reading skills um, is something that um, is good to continue into early secondary school. Um, yeah, um, and um, um, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, just <laughs> uh, recap. Yes, don't think I'm saying, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, something happened on my computer. I just lost uh, track. Yeah, okay, sorry, I'm back. Um, yes, so um, I, I think I have time, plenty of time for um, a third question or third study. Um, and this is something that's a bit slightly different from the previous two studies. This is um, something I'm doing now for my um, fellowship project, uh, my uh, postdoc fellowship. And that is um, looking at the association between uh, children's reading habits and their theory of mind. So I'm interested in any sort of potential benefits of um, reading, reading motivation, and in this case, um, reading fiction and how that can have any uh, beneficial effects on children's social understanding. So on their um, ability to understand other people's emotions, intentions and beliefs. Um, and from the literary, literary research, literacy, oh my god, I'm just... <laughs> Ah, I think it's because it's four <laughs> in the afternoon. Okay. <laughs> no <laughs> worries. <laughs> yes, so literacy uh, research, um, there has been some attention for theory of mind as a sort of necessary skill for um, high li level reading comprehension. So um, that um, a better theory of mind can help you make inferences about um, authors' intentions, um, understanding the uh, intentions and emotions of characters depicted in a text um, and can help you create um, a mental model of a text. Um, and um, the alternative view that I'm interested in here is almost sort of the opposite direction, is how much um, reading you do and especially reading narrative fiction can maybe um, enrich, um, have potential effects on someone's theory of mind, whether that's by just placing yourself in the shoes of a character when you read, just practicing that skill of doing that, or whether it's encountering mental states that are different from, um, so views that are different from your own and that you would maybe otherwise not so easily encounter in everyday life, or um, whether it's just because exposure to fiction gives you um, exposure to, um, the type of language that you may need to um, communicate um, or interpret more complex emotions and intentions and belief. Um, and that's something I'm um, trying to look into, um, have been trying to look into over the past couple of years uh, as well, um, by also following this same longitudinal sample that I've um, talked about for the past 
half hour. Um, and um, so there is some previous research out there that has looked at this, um, and at least from um, research um, on uh, children, we see that there seems to be this correlation between uh, their false belief understanding or theory of mind uh, skills and the amount of reading they do. Um, and um, there's a bit more uh, literature out there on uh, studies with adults, uh, but also mainly correlational or experimental studies that do also seem to suggest that there is this uh, concurrent relation between uh, reading fiction and someone's theory of mind. Um, but as this is mainly um, correlational research or concurrent, so um, two measures measured at the same time point, um, we were interested in um, whether you see, um, if you measure this over time, whether you see a longitudinal or developmental uh, relation there as well. And hopefully we can say a bit more about the direction of this relation. So whether it's theory of mind that's beneficial for, um, uh, um, sorry, reading that's beneficial for your theory of mind, or whether it's just that children who perform better on these theory of mind tasks also for some reason enjoy reading or like to read more in their own time. So um, in this third study, we wanted to look into the uh, longitudinal association between um, children's um, fiction reading and theory of mind. Um, and just to see if we could replicate previous studies, because especially for the age group we're looking at, so early adolescence, there wasn't a lot out there. So we wanted to see first if, if you measure this at the same time point, so um, do we see this correlation there like other people have found? And then when you measure this longitudinally, do we also find this developmental relation? So does your earlier reading behavior affect your later theory of mind? Um, and um, we wanted to control for uh, verbal ability and text comprehension to rule out that um, any relation here is just due to um, comprehension or verbal skills. Um, and um, to rule out whether it's reading in general that might be for some reason beneficial for um, maybe this theory of mind ability um, or whether it's specifically fiction that contains um, more social content, um, um, requires maybe more inferences about mental states of characters as opposed to um, informational texts, so non-fiction. So with nonfiction, I really mean here informational texts. Um, so yeah, I've been following this same longitudinal sample um, from year eight. So from when they were 12 or 13 uh, onwards, um, now up until um, year 11, um, haven't been able to go into schools um, this year, but uh, that is certainly the plan. Um, but the data I'm talking about um, now is a data I collected um, when children were um, in year eight, so when they were 12 or 13. That's when we started to uh, measure their uh, theory of mind. And um, as a measure of um, the fiction and non-fiction reading behavior, um, I used um, this same reading qu questionnaire that I talked about um, for study two and used questions that um, ask children about the um, reading of stories or novels, fiction, and um, used questions from the questionnaire that uh, asked about um, reading of um, inform for informational text. So reading to um, want to learn things or reading books that explain things, those kind of questions. And of course, again, um, vocabulary and reading comprehension, the same measures as um, I've showed you before. So this is the theory of mind measure. Let's see if this um, works. So this is um, uh, the silent films task um, developed by Divine and Use. And um, children are shown uh, short clips from a silent movie, um, as is running here. And um, they, for each clip, they're asked questions about uh, what characters think and why they act um, in a certain way. So, so I'll, I'll just let this run. See if you can answer the questions I'm about to show you later.
And these are, so this is the question that they're asked. So uh, why do you think the men hide? What do you think the, the woman is thinking? And um, so um, this is the results, the models from um, the concurrent association. So when we measured uh, their reading habits and their theory of mind at the same time point, just to see if we could replicate previous studies. Um, and um, you can see here that um, we did find a significant relation between the amount of fiction children reported to read and um, their theory of mind performance. Um, and we did not find a significant uh, relation correlation with uh, nonfiction reading, which does seem to show that this um, relation between theory of mind and reading is at least, um, as we expect, specific for fiction and not for reading in general, so not for nonfiction in this case. Um, and even after controlling for these background measures here, so vocabulary, reading comprehension, um, age, SES, and gender. Um, and this is um, the longitudinal model. So when we had our measures at age 11, predicting theory of mind at age 12, 13. Um, and here we found no significant relation between their, the amount of fiction they read and the amount of nonfiction children read, um, which is of course always a bit more difficult to explain. Um, yeah, so at least we found that there is, um, um, our sample shows that children's fiction, but non, not their nonfiction reading is associated with their theory of mind. Um, and we, in this case, we did not find a longitudinal relation between their reading habits and their theory of mind. Um, and of course, what I said, that can mean many things. It could be um, that there is no relation. That could be that um, this relation might be in the opposite direction, as I mentioned um, before. So it could be that it's not that your theory of mind, so your reading benefits your social understanding, but maybe more socially oriented, interested uh, people um, like to read more fiction in their own time, something like that, or um, something that we are trying to refine, tr have tried to refine for a later time point is, of course, the way we measure things. Um, it might be that it's um, fiction reading that's important, but specific types of fiction. So we're trying to refine our measure of um, reading exposure by trying to um, get more insight on what what exactly children are reading, what types of fiction. So it could be that certain types of fiction that contain more um, social, that contains more social contact might be more beneficial. Um, so that's what we're trying to figure out now. And um, of course, a difficulty is that even though you still see a development in theory of mind skills um, um, at this age, it's of course, like many of our measures, not as rapid as it is for very early on in development. So that always makes uh, modeling um, growth uh, more challenging um, because there's just very little growth um, overall. Um, and uh, something we want to look into is the level of exposure to fiction that um, is needed to be beneficial. So um, it could be that this only becomes apparent over a longer time frame when there's more reading going on and take longer to accumulate. Or, um, and a difficulty here as well, adolescence, a time when children do not read that much in their own time. It's what we also see from our questionnaires, um, whether they're not interested or they simply don't have time to, or for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, so there's still a lot of work to do. And one of the things I've been doing and want to do is to continue following over time. So we can um, hopefully say a bit more about the direction of the effects by um, um, looking at this in both directions. So um, reading exposure, predicting later theory of mind or whether it's theory of mind that predicts how much time children spend reading fiction. And as I said, trying to refine um, the way we measure both actually. So yeah, um, this was a lot of information, um, three studies. Um, I know that's always uh, tricky, but um, just to very quickly, very briefly summarize the three studies, try to sort of capture them in one sentence, which is of course um, difficult. But um, so what we found for this great longitudinal sample that we've been able to follow over a very long time is that um, at the end of primary, early secondary education, we still saw significant growth in both vocabulary and reading over time, 
and that there were some subtle differences in whether you're from a higher or lower SES background or um, the certain types of um, measures that we used. Um, we also saw that independent reading, um, so reading children do in their own time outside of school is important for their vocabulary, um, as well as still their sort of basic decoding word reading skills. Um, and um, finally, that there seems to, we seem to have sort of found additional evidence for this association with uh, fiction reading in theory of mind, but um, there's a lot of work to do there to see um, what explains this relation um, and how this develops over time. And this is sort of what I wanted to um, talk to you about today. So thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions if, if there are any. Thank you very much. A realish life clap. <laughs> we do have, uh, that was a really interesting talk. Thank you. A lot of information, but like yes, really cool sorry. studies and such a, an amazing long like data collection process. Like, yeah, it's really, yeah, very cool. Um, so someone in the audience has asked if you'd be happy to share your slides to start with. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, I mean, if you can send me the slides, then I can. Yeah, yeah we'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, I think this is a comment for you. Um, they say the Strategic Education Research Partnership Institute has done quite a bit of research on academic language development. So maybe that's something if you're interested to look into. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So about the type of academic vocabulary then mentioned at the end yeah yeah there's um a link to that in the chat if you're oh able great to get that yeah. Now, so. that. yeah I know that um I know Catherine Snow for instance has done a lot of research on academic vocabulary as well so I know there's stuff out there but uh, yeah definitely interested in that great um I'll ask you a question whilst no one is raising a hand or anything in the chat um I was wondering if you found like any gendered effects um especially maybe on independent reading because I know that in secondary school um you know boys don't tend to be reading as much out of choice um so is that something you looked at at all um not specifically not in any of the um, previous just in um my um like my the, the last study I showed um yeah I, th I think you do see that boys seem to read less than girls um and uh I don't know about other types of so I haven't looked at reading motivation for instance but I, I, I yeah it would be interesting to do that um do we have any questions from the audience Um, I had a question uh, um, also about the last study, the theory of mind study. Um, did you, and I, I, you might've shown it, but I forgot to look. Did you see growth in theory of mind in, in all, um, not, like good readers and poor readers or in all groups over that transition period to middle school or? Um, I haven't looked at that in that way. That would be I, interesting. I thought was that in middle school, uh, children develop more social relationships and their theory of mind generally develops so that you might have like um, any difference between the, the readers of fiction and non-readers of fiction would be kind of diluted out because the strong theory of mind de development could be just from the increased social interactions that they have every day and younger children don't have that. Um, and yeah, so it was just a thought yeah yeah so there yeah so there is um what is there is significant growth um in theory of mind over this uh it, this age when we when we look at this silent film uh task that we've assessed multiple time points but um growth overall is very small and yeah i agree that of course the biggest development in your social understanding skills is i think from just social interaction and the proportion explained by reading in your own time and reading fiction might be small um to begin with um so yeah that could also explain why we didn't find it i haven't really looked at growth and theory of mind like over that transition period and um 
that would be interesting. I also have some measures of children's social motivation. So how much they like to interact with others, um, how much time they like to spend on their own, um, whether they enjoy spending time on their own. So that might also be interesting to look at in, in relation to that sort of transition to secondary to, to middle school. Yeah, thanks. Hope I sort of answered your question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but you know, that's, that, that's great. I just didn't wanna um, take over too much of the time in case other people have questions. Would you be able to also maybe post your email or if uh, Dr. Perry could post the email your email. I just have something, a, a book I wanted to recommend and it might not oh, be. Oh, great. Okay. Sorry, open to that, thanks. Do we have any questions? Um, I, I have a question. Um, so from the first study, um, you know, there was quite a lot of variability within the different SES groups. Um, I was wondering like where you thought that variability might come from. So, you know, what is it like if you are from a low SES background, what still might mean that you are like a strong reader or have strong vocabulary skills? Do you like have thought about any sort of protective factors? Oh, oh, that's a very good but difficult question. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, not just because of the way we measured it, but just in general, it's very hard to tease apart any genetic or environmental effects. Um, um, but I, yeah, I don't know. Oh, there's anyone here um, who has a good answer. I, yeah, it's difficult because um, I think school, um home environment so um that you're from a lower SES background doesn't mean that you don't have a parent who doesn't love to read or um get um the language input you get in in the home is not always um it's, like it's not such a clear sort of um from a lower SES back coming from a lower SES background doesn't mean that you get um less quality or or um language input or less quality uh reading instruction or help so yeah I always I, to be honest I find it difficult to even yeah so I so I think um that's something we haven't been able to capture so I think a lot of that might some of the protective factors might just be um that even though you're from a lower SES background you still um have someone in the home or have a lot of books in the home or I don't know um yeah that makes sense um, I, I also so, yeah. suggest um, maybe teacher effects as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's impact. what I mean. There's so many things that um, can help you. Um, um, yeah, in that sense. So, uh, it, yeah, it's definitely not something we've been able to tease apart. And I think a lot of studies struggle with that as well, because uh, I know Elsie from Bergen. I don't know if you know her work. She does a lot of interesting stuff on literacy and um, um, genetic um factors mm. she has a really great a paper on that as well that sort of also argues for um that SES is often seen as lower SES background but it's it's very hard to tease apart environmental and genetic factors um sure. yeah and still have really like sensitive measures that aren't, yeah yeah no I understand the, the, the struggle with that yeah yeah, yeah. sorry it's a terrible <laughs> answer but I just don't know it <laughs> no 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 I just thought it was interesting to consider maybe um yeah yeah we have a question in the chat um I wonder if there was a discussion about the impacts on children's communication of the results of the study regarding reading and transition from primary to secondary schools particularly related to everyday vocabulary uh Sorry, I don't know if I fully got this discussion. Of the so can you maybe um, clarify what you mean with communication of children, com like impacts on children or communication of the results or? Your question, sorry. Oh. 
because I don't think I fully understand the um, question. Don't know if you, Ruben, if you. Uh, ah, the, Do you have an idea of the impact of the level of vocabulary impact? on communication in a different way in the two settings yes oh, no, oh yeah, no yeah so i think so you think you mean that um, um the importance of vocabulary um in primary compared to when they were in secondary school so um and the way they can express themselves it becomes more important if that has a stronger impact in your performance in secondary education than in primary education or something that's sort of how i interpret this um <laughs> um, yes, I think that is probably also something what I try to say with um, expectations change in secondary context. I think that um, um, again, I'm not a primary, uh, not a, a secondary school teacher, so I have very limited experience in that context. But um, I do think it becomes more important um, for the type, the way you are assessed, the type of. Um, um, uh, the way you learn in secondary school, but also the assessments, um, because it's become verbal ability, I think, becomes more and more important. Um, so I can imagine that um, limited vocabulary um, is something maybe easy, something, it becomes more and more difficult to um, compensate um, when the expectations increase so dramatically in secondary education. Um, from the audience, maybe time for one or two more. Okay, I think in that case, then, um, we will finish today's session. Thank you so much again. That was a really interesting presentation. And yes, some interesting discussion afterwards from everyone. Um, oh, thanks so much. Yeah. Hope I didn't overwhelm everyone with all the information. No, 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 just, it's great. I'm talking about this. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have lots of results. <laughs> yeah. Getting lots of thank yous in the chat as well. Ah, thanks.